welcome to the Black Table, Black Star Network. My name is Greg Carr, and I'm your host. Here at the Black Table, uh, we devote an hour every Friday to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to African people and others fighting to build a better society. If you've been following us so far, every week we add layers to understanding how we place ideas, figures, uh, politics, in larger and larger contexts. So we can understand that everything local is affected by the global, is affected by larger forces. And today we're taking the next step in that process. And it's a major step in that process. We're being joined today by Professor uh, John Monroe, who is at the University of Birmingham uh, in England, uh, a major scholar, uh, worker, intellectual worker, with expertise across the board dealing with social movements and intersections of race and U.S. imperial culture and international contexts. And we're here to discuss today, in particular, his 2017 book, The Anti-Colonial Front, The African-American Freedom Struggle and Global Decolonization, 1945 to 1960. This is a truly remarkable book. And we're welcoming to the Black Table today, Professor John. Oh, John, thank you for taking some time to spend with us today, brother. My honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when I purchased this book and I'm glad for those of you who purchased this book is now a paperback, right, John? It is a paperback now. Yeah. OK, because it was in hardback when it first came out. And, you know, my little HBCU professor salary, I'm in, I'm in the academic bookstore. I'm saying, what is this? I picked it up and I couldn't put it down. So I, I had to get the book, man. I mean, it is truly a remarkable work. And if I understand correctly from what you've written, um, it began life as a dissertation. In fact, it began life apparently in a, in, in a class you were in in 2001, right? where, you, where you actually uh, encountered someone you actually got a chance to spend some time with. And that is, of course, the legendary Jack O'Dell. But before we get to any of that, help us understand some of your origins, man, where you come from and how did you get involved in this work? And how did you come to this intellectual work that produced the anti-colonial front? Yeah, great. Um, well, you know, I guess another way of putting that question is, how does this white guy from Canada come to writing about African American history in a broad global context? And I would say the short answer is my teachers. Um, and I would say the longer answer is exactly one of the one of the um, moments that you that you point to there that I kind of begin the book with, which is a really generative uh, moment for me in terms of coming to this work and and recognizing its its significance. Um, I was a returning student uh, to finish off an undergraduate degree um, in uh, the year 2000, 2001. And uh, I took uh, some history classes. I took a class on African-American history with uh, Professor Karen Ferguson at Simon Fraser University in, in Canada. Um, and it was through that class that I, you know, I thought it was an interesting topic. But what I what I came to see in that class was the, the centrality you know, when you live in Canada, you, you know the United States is an important country in the world. That part's easy. But what I came to understand was the significance of the Black experience in the United States to the history of the world and actually understanding um, anti understanding racism and understanding resistance in the U.S. was a really key sort of component to, to unlocking world history and getting that kind of deeper sense of, of global politics, as well as obviously the very significant politics within the United States uh, as well. So that so that's what led me ultimately to to meeting uh, Mr. Odell, Karen Ferguson um, in one of her classes. We had a small seminar, me and a couple other students, and she invited us to, to meet with Mr. Odell. I didn't quite know who he was at the time in, in 2001. And we were reading Penny Von Eschen's Race Against Empire, which is you know, a remarkable, remarkable book of its own, looking at the international um, you know, anti-colonial dimensions of the black freedom struggle around the mid 20th century. And reading that book with, with Jack O'Dell was just such a such a formative experience because the that book, you know, argues very strongly that anti-communism in many ways kind of snuffed out the, um, the 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 resistance struggle that was coming out of the 30s and, and into the 1940s th through McCarthyism. Um, and there's quite a bit to, to say about that. But reading it with with Jack O'Dell, it was also very apparent that that Mr. O'Dell had been you know, indeed bruised by anti-communism, but nonetheless very much weathered through it and continued on to have, you know, a significant influence in a number of different really important places in social movements across the 20th century. Um, 
And so that led me uh, to my great good fortune to um, to have an opportunity to be a, a research assistant for for Jack O'Dell, organizing his papers primarily um, for uh, some of them are at the Schomburg and uh, and a lot of them are going to be at the at the Tamman. So both both in in New York. Oh, excellent. Um, at, at NYU. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Glad to hear that. And then a lot of folks won't know uh, John H. Jack O'Dell, but they will know his handiwork. I mean, I didn't know him either until I was an adult and realized having worked on the Jesse Jackson campaign in 84 as a sophomore at Tennessee State, you, if you pull on Operation Push or Jesse Jackson or Martin Luther King and Brett, out falls Jack O'Dell. <laughs> How does this guy become somebody we just don't hear about all the time? And you you actually were his research assistant, huh, uh, John? Yes, indeed. And and what that meant, Greg, was that I would go over to his house, him and, and his partner, Jane Power, also an important historian, activist and intellectual as well. And I would go over to their house for, for a year. I went over to their house every week and I would work with the papers and begin to organize stuff. Um, and then after a couple hours of that, we'd have lunch in the living room. And then, you know, it would, it would often be like, oh, I found this, it's something about uh, apartheid, say. Um, and we would have, you know, it would basically turn into like a lunchtime seminar for two hours. You know, the lunches were, were, were long um, and they were, as you can imagine, just absolutely profound. And so, so I just learned many, many things through those conversations. Um, I'm really glad that Nikhil Singh um, organized some of uh, Mr. O'Dell's writing and, and gave it that fantastic introduction so yes. people can have a, a way into to Jack O'Dell's thought because it just touches on and connects together so many different things. Absolutely. In fact, I'm looking over here on the spine. I see it over on the shelf and in the kill Singh, who, of course, was very gracious in, in writing a, a blurb for you, which talks about the importance of your book, which, of course, takes us from the end of World War II up until what a lot of people think of as the traditional civil rights movement in the 1960s. But before we get there, and I want to ask you in a minute to just kind of give us a tease of the major theses of the text, uh, you end up at one of the most important formations for thinking about, quote unquote, radical intellectual work uh, in, in the contemporary moment, and that's the University of California, Santa Barbara. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I, I teach uh, Cedric Robinson's Black Movements in America every semester in my Introduction to African Studies class, and Howard Winer was actually on faculty at Temple when I was there. But you opened the text by devoting it to Nelson Lichtenstein, of course, the great labor historian and, and social movements historian. But I mean, everybody that you engaged there, tell us a little bit about what that was like, that intense kind of formation with some of the cutting and then Rod Bush. I mean, there's so many other people you encounter along the way they find their way into this text could you say a little bit about those those influences yeah i'm very happy to because that really continues exactly this point that is the teachers right that are just so important to to how we we come to our to our ideas and so so after that kind of time in vancouver with with jack odell and karen ferguson um i then went to graduate school at uc santa barbara uh, and I worked and Nelson Lichtenstein um, was my was my advisor, the great labor historian. And incidentally, just just last week, I was at a wonderful conference um, celebrating his career because he's he's just retired. It was really nice to to get a chance to do that. But of course, at UC Santa Barbara, I also had the opportunity to work with Cedric Robinson um, and George Lipsitz, Howard Winant, uh, Alice O'Connor, a number of of just, I mean, incredible, incredible mentors and, and scholars. Um, and of course, we are all you know, diminished by the loss of, of Cedric Robinson. Um, like like Nikhil Singh's book on, on Jack O'Dell, I'm, I'm so grateful to Joshua Myers for publishing that incredible biography of, of Cedric Robinson. It's so it's so nice to to have that. I should um, mention, John, uh, I should mention, John, that uh, I put black uh, uh, black Marxism in Josh's hand during a study abroad when he was an undergraduate at Howard. Now, that's how he got introduced to Cedric Robinson. So it comes full circle. <laughs> Well done. Yeah, well done. no, no, no. I mean, but but to your point, in terms of teachers, in fact, but you engage just about every scholar I'm aware of, anyway, on this period and on the question of radicalism, on the question of popular front, a uh, concept that you you kind of use to 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 as a lens, the anti-colonial front. Could you, before we take our first break, uh, give us a sense? You you, you state four theses at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you say kind of frame your project. Could you mention, as, as folks are beginning to think about this book, what those yeah. major theses are? Yeah, great. Let me mention them and then maybe we can unpack them a little bit uh, after that. And just very quickly before I do that, just because you mentioned Rod Bush, you know, another person oh, that's yes. we're, we're sad that we've, we've lost because I met him at a seminar in New York and he was just 
again, just such a generous and, and wonderful uh, scholar. So I just wanted to, to get that in there as well. Yeah. So let me just say quickly to answer your question about the arguments. Yeah, that's right. There's four, there's four arguments to the book. One is that um, black radical internationalism and anti-colonialism persisted despite anti-communism. That would be the first, that was sort of the first main argument that, that sort of pulled the, pulls the other arguments together. But the other arguments I feel are important as well, that black anti-fascism um, in the United States is, is also an anti-colonialism. And we can unpack that uh, a little bit, but just to get them on the table for now. Um, I also have an argument about black liberals in that their relationship to, to US empire and anti-imperialism was kind of a complicated one. There's, there's a debate there, um, probably best represented by Gerald Horn on the one hand and, and Carol Anderson on the other. And I kind of try to formulate a sort of third position in relation to this question of, of black liberalism. Um, and finally, uh, the, the relationship between colonialism and the Cold War, that's the kind of largest, most global sort of argument that I want to, to engage in. In retrospect, not necessarily as, as thoroughly as I might have, because I'm still thinking about that one, but I wanted to say something about the way that the Cold War is sort of gets all the attention um, in terms of global dynamics after World War II, but actually it's the colonial, anti-colonial dynamic that matters the most. Thank you, John. That's perfect. And, and when we come back, in a moment, we will continue our conversation with you with Professor John Monroe, the University of Birmingham, on his book, The Anti-Colonial Front. Back in a moment at the Black Tape. For decades, the tobacco industry has deliberately targeted black communities and kids with marketing for menthol cigarettes. It's had a devastating impact on black health. Tobacco use claims 45,000 black lives every year. It's the number one cause of preventable death. In the 1950s, less than 10% of black smokers used menthol cigarettes. Today, it's 85%. Menthol cools and numbs the throat, making it easier for kids to start smoking. Menthol also increases addiction, making it harder for smokers to quit. Menthol cigarettes are a big reason why black Americans have a harder time quitting smoking and die at higher rates from smoking-related diseases like cancer, heart disease, and stroke. It's time to stop big tobacco from profiting off black lives. An FDA ban on menthol cigarettes will improve black health, save lives, and protect future generations from addiction. Learn more at tobaccofreekids.org slash ban menthol. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show, Get Wealthy, focuses on the things that your financial advisor and bank isn't telling you, but you absolutely need to know. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. We're back at the Black Table. Uh, Greg Carr, Black Star Network, joined today by John Monroe, professor at the University of Birmingham and the author of The Anti-Colonial Front. The Anti-Colonial Front. Uh, when we left, uh, John, you had just laid out the four kind of broad framing theses that frame your book. And, and I hope that before we get into chapter one, uh, you might take a little bit more time and kind of articulate how you came to those theses, because you're right. I mean, it, as I was reading, of course, and, and your footnotes are just remarkable and a lot of, a lot of this archival research, but also the secondary literature you put, you, you you are very, a very generous scholar. In other words, you whatever differences you have, you, you take what you can from folks who have written, who have talked, who have worked, and then you say, okay, but this is what I'm going to suggest. And you're right. I, immediately between Carol Anderson with Bourgeois Radicals and Gerald Horn, you know, who's a, you don't really, you know, could you walk us through this? And for folks who might not know what, 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 what we're talking about so far, one of the things that you really emphasize is you can't understand here in the United States, for example, 
Brown versus Board of Education, the Montgomery bus boycott, any of the so-called civil rights movement without framing it against what is happening in the world after the end of World War II, the formation of the, the international imperial structures that kind of renew themselves, the UN, the World Bank, the International Money Fund, however you want to put it, and all of the anti-colonial movements that are opposing the colonial reconfiguration that happens after World War II. Could you help us help us understand why that period from 1945 to the 1960s is so important and why we don't talk about it as much as we should because you know in, here in the US we think about boycotts and marches and it's like you can't understand that without the global context. Yeah, great. That's that great question. It's a lot to connect. I would maybe start by saying that the the anti-colonial struggle resumes the very day that World War II ends. So when victory in Europe is being celebrated um, with the surrender of the Nazis, that very day, Algerians begin to mobilize and march for, for independence um, in, in May of 1945. In the Pacific theater, uh, the very day World War II ends as the Japanese uh, forces are signing the instrument of surrender in, in Tokyo Bay. That's the very day that Ho Chi Minh in, uh, in Batting Square in, in Hanoi uh, proclaims Vietnamese independence. So, this, so this, this international context that you're talking about, um, I agree, of course, it's hugely important. And it, 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 it begins immediately, I mean, kind of symbolically in that sense, on, on the very day that World War II ends in, in each theater. Um, so, so this frames and kind of connects a number of issues that are happening in the United States. And of course, the Black freedom struggle in the United States, you know, as your um, viewers will, will know very well, does not begin with, with Brown versus Board of Education, the, the Black radical tradition and, and other traditions of, of Black resistance go, you know, back um, to 1619, if you want to date them to there, but, but in, in different sort of um, articulations uh, over time. So what I would say is you have these two intertwined challenges to white supremacy uh, in, in the global arena, the, the, the anti-colonial struggle in the global self and the black freedom movement in the United States. Um, to answer the other part of your question, I would say, why are they are these phenomena less connected or, or are not always as, as strongly connected as they might be? I mean, one, one way it kind of makes sense is that we, we often understand things in a national frame, and there are things to be seen by understanding African-American history in a U.S. national frame. There's important dimensions that if we that could get blurred out if we're if we're only and always situating things in, in the global context. But that said, there's been a lot of attention within the national context. And and I feel like one, one useful way to think about it, and again, this is very much a lesson from, from Jack O'Dell and others that I've learned, is that the global context matters for thinking about national histories in, in any number of, of situations. Uh, okay, well, the first four chapters, you introduce us to a number of figures whose names we know, very broadly, and then so many more whose names are lesser known. And in fact, when you begin chapter one with W.E.B. Du Bois and Black Reconstruction in America, one of his lesser known works, as we both know, uh, folks think of the souls of black folk as if, wow, that was like a lot of years before Du Bois. <laughs> but, but by the time we finish those first four chapters, you've taken us from uh, du Bois and the anti-colonial movement it is moving. And in chapter two, you go to the Fifth Pan-African Congress in Manchester and give us a peek as to what's going on in England with these African students and so many other folks, uh, which, by the way, I found fascinating this preliminary meeting that was proposed by Du Bois at the Schomburg Center, which was fascinating because there are a lot of Howard University faculty who respond mm -hmm. there, tends to William Leo Hansberry and others. And then chapter three, you draw attention to something that I think some of our viewers have probably never heard of, the first SNCC. The student, uh, the the student nonviolent coordinating committee is the second SNCC. When I mean, you got the Southern Negro Youth Conference and a very important lecture that Dr. Du Bois gave on the campus. I, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Benedict College in Columbia, South Carolina. Behold the land. I think about contemporary in Georgia and Mississippi and people saying you can't flip the South. Du Bois said the future of America is in the South to these radical students and Adam Clayton Powell and others who are there. These formations and then that that last chapter in this first cluster. When you talk about Marxist anti-colonialism, you focus in on some very important publications, uh, Paul Robeson's Freedom, of course, um, Political Affairs, uh, which, you know, the, the house organ in some ways of the Communist Party USA, and then the Crisis Magazine. I mean, it, it, help us understand how these figures who we often hear about, Paul Robeson, W.B. Du Bois, Jackie Robinson, who we'll talk about a bit later, how they connect to this larger world and how we really can't understand what we're usually taught in this country about them without placing them in this context you've placed them in. 
Yeah, great. Um, again, a lot of things to, to connect up here, but I think Dr. Du Bois is at the center of, of much of this. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, you write a book and then some time passes. And then if you think back on it, because, you know, when I was so so grateful to get your invitation to speak with you, I was thinking, okay, I got to think, you know, to the book. It's been, it's been a little while since it was published. Sure. And I feel like one of the through lines of the book is actually Black Reconstruction. You know, I kind of begin that first chapter with it and it keeps coming up in different places. And the analysis that that Du Bois puts forward there, of course, again, you know, um, clearly uh, one of the most important generative social histories we have, full stop, um, but that also puts abolition democracy during Reconstruction in a very international context and looks at it very much as a challenge to imperialism as well as a challenge to white supremacy in, in the South. And so there's, you know, a connection there to his Behold the Land speech um, in 1946 in which he's arguing exactly as you say, the South is, is the center of this and the, the fight must be won in the South, but also in order for that larger global struggle to also be, be successful um, as well. So, and Du Bois of course is in, is in Manchester. Um, so, so following, so his papers, you know, for, for other researchers who are looking at this, uh, that may already know, but if you don't, Du Bois' papers is, is one, you know, wonderful source that kind of brings a lot of this stuff together, particularly through Du Bois's correspondence, because he was the one who was, you know, corresponding with so many figures um, every day, basically throughout this, throughout and, and well beyond um, this period. Now, those publications you mentioned, those are, those were crucial to me um, for exactly establishing this ongoing, this, this kind of um, continuity of resistance that takes place, because of course, those years of McCarthyism were really hard on, on progressive leftist, anti-racist, internationalist activists. And Paul Robeson, of course, and, and W.E.B. Du Bois are among the most famous for having their passports uh, taken away. Others like C.L.R. James and Claudia Jones were, of course, deported. Um, Esther Cooper Jackson and James Jackson's family suffered, you know, directly through repression within the country. There are, of course, many examples of this. So the question becomes then how do you explain and how do you how do you track as a historian this ongoing conversation and i feel like those three publications that each one has a distinct politics from the other um are, are real ways of kind of bridging those years and and showing that the that the that the african-american focus on issues of imperialism is absolutely a through line throughout this whole period of mccarthyism mccarthyism does not shut this down so, 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 John, okay, help me because there's going to be a lot of people who say, when I think NAACP, I think voting rights, I think, you know, what, but you attach the NAACP through the crisis and beyond to uh, the anti apartheid movement in South Africa. Um, I think a lot of times when people think about uh, the civil rights movement in the United States, we don't think about it in an international context. Um, this may be, for example, the first time some people have heard of the Pan-African Congress as a concept in Manchester. Um, so could you help us? And then of course, overarching all of this, some people may say, well, what's McCarthyism? There's this anti-communist thrust in the United States. Could you help us understand the kind of, uh, the fact that all of these organizations, regardless of their individual political positions, kind of all were working in this global struggle because we usually don't think about them that way, at least not in the kind of conventional narrative. Yeah, good, another great question. So I would say for, for your viewers, I mean, one shorthand way of thinking about McCarthyism is just think of it as the the um, critical race theory paranoia of the 1950s, like a certain a certain figure, the critical race theory today, communism back then, that's essentially mobilized to shut down any challenges to a given system of power, to to shut down any challenges to the, the gendered racial um, and class ordering of things in a society like the United States. So, so that's that's kind of the work that McCarthy. I mean, it's, it's distinct and different, but I think that 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 kind of that works as a comparison. I think just in the way that it it's meant to shut down any kind of um, opposition or even reform, not even just radical challenge, but even moderate challenge as well. Um, so this is so this is how these distinct traditions work then, and how they and how they all are managing to continue this conversation. So so briefly, I would say you know for the Communist Party. Uh, and that's through the, the magazine Political Affairs. So they are, you know, they're relentless in their criticism of capitalism, imperialism, and the United States, of course, the capitalist imperialist system within the United States. Um, Paul Robeson's freedom shares many of those commitments, but they have a more specific anti-racist um, uh, sort of agenda, which you can see more, more prominently. So it's not that they necessarily disagree, but the emphasis is different. Um, and I think this is why freedom 
um, is such a is such a remarkable and generative work to to look at because it's it's you know fundamentally um, an anti racist publication of the Black Freedom Movement that that very much has a critique of of capitalism and imperialism. Now the the crisis the NAACP so there this is where the Black liberals come in and, and white liberals who are writing for for this publication as well. And as Carol Anderson has shown, there's, you know, we might be a bit surprised to see the extent of the critique of, of apartheid, of the European imperialist powers. But where that critique kind of stops short, it's not that the critique isn't there and that McCarthyism ends it and shuts it down. But where it stops short is on criticizing capitalism, usually, and also criticizing the United States directly. Um, that was That's where you would see... Um, a really significant difference in terms of, say, political affairs criticizing the U.S. and the NAACP. Of course, the flip side of that is that political affairs um, is very short on critiques of Stalinism and the Soviet Union, um, whereas the crisis is, of course, very willing to, to go there and make those criticisms as well. Yes. Well, uh, we're going to pause here, John, just for a second to take a break. And when we come back, let's let's dig deep in that, because when you get to Chapter 5, you really do put this on the table, uh, this confrontation with some of the contradictions here in the United States that these freedom fighters are fighting. And then and, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, when we come back here, the Black Table, Black Star Network, Red Car, back in a moment. Big Tobacco targets black communities with marketing for menthol cigarettes. In the 1950s, less than 10% used menthol cigarettes. Today, it's 85%. FDA, ban menthol cigarettes, save lives. Welcome back to The Black Table. Uh, we are deep into a conversation with Professor John Monroe, author of the book, The Anti-Colonial Front. And when we left, uh, uh, Prof, we were coming into uh, your chapter five, Resilient Resistance, the Uneven Impact of Anti-Communism. And could you kind of uh, help us, uh, before we get to chapter six in the Bandung world, all of these actors, like you say, Paul Robeson, and you talked about a little bit uh, in terms of the Smith Act. You, you, you talk about how they're called before Congress. If it's Claudia Jones or CLR James, they're deported. Uh, but there, there are even some characters in this drama that whose names we know probably better than any of these folks, like Jackie Robinson and Langston Hughes. How, how, could you talk about what the climate was like in the 50s with this McCarthyism and the Smith Act and how this really, this, this attack on, on, on freedom movements and social movements in the United States has to be placed in this larger context. Yeah, it's hard to imagine just how difficult it must have been, you know, especially for black figures in the United States who are dealing with, who are, who are trying to have careers, you know, and live their lives under the conditions of, of open white supremacy on the one hand, and then anti-communism on the other, combining to again, you know, in an attempt to stifle any kind of uh, critique. So, so we might say more more moderate figures like like Jackie Robinson is trying to is trying to negotiate this and navigate this. And you know, and and obviously later, 
has, has some regrets about how that went in terms of what happened to Paul Robeson, for instance, um, and the ways that that black, you know, intellectuals, artists, athletes were, were made to, to the price of the ticket, you know, was that, um, that they, that they had to, to, to some degree, at least outwardly conform with the, with the kind of the cold war order, I guess we would say. Um, so I feel like the first thing is just to, just to try to, um, emphasize just how difficult it must have been for everybody. And it would be really easy for somebody like me at the, you know, again, a white guy from Canada in the 21st century saying, oh, this person wasn't sufficiently brave in the face of this. You know, that, that doesn't seem like a very productive way to, to approach this, but rather to just try to understand the politics of the moment and how people got through them. That said, remarkable bravery was also very much in evidence on a number of these, of these figures. I mean, Robeson, we, we take any, anybody you like, but Robeson, um, is, is a classic example, as you know so well. Um, he was, you know, one of the greatest um, celebrities and, and intellectuals um, and, and artists and mo most recognized of his of his age. And for him to to be such a, a critic, you know, to, to, to such a degree, um, and and obviously the impact that that had, the negative impact that had on his career, his mental health. Um, it's it's just it's something to to behold. Um, I was part of, I'll just mention briefly that I, when I lived in Vancouver, I was part of a, a group of people who did an oral history around the, um, when Paul Robeson came to the, to the U.S. Canada border yes, and, yes. And, and sang and, and we had, we had an event to sort of mark the 50th anniversary of that. And, and Danny Glover came and he gave the same speech that, that Robeson gave back at the time. It was just, you know, absolutely, uh, so moving and, and so, so remarkable. So, so this, this was the politics of the moment and this was how, um, you know, a number of these figures, Jack O'Dell um, and, and Claudia Jones, of course, is deported. But what does she do when she gets to the UK? <laughs> Resumes organizing, founds the carnival, you know, becomes one of the, the most important figures in the anti-racist fight there as well. Yeah. So this this global dimension matters. And many of the activists uh, in the Black freedom struggle continue to, to insist on its importance throughout this whole period, despite the, the, the real difficulties that were put in front of them. Absolutely. In fact, let's let's take it uh, international for the remaining few minutes of this block. And, and of course, because this is everywhere, streaming everywhere. Shout out to the homies in Notting Hill and the Carnival and Cla Claudia Jones, who, as uh, as we know, Carol Boyce Davies in her book reminds us, is buried in the same cemetery left of Karl Marx. <laughs> Literally. So, mm -hmm. man, but by the time when, when you dig into the Afro-Asian conference, the Bandung Conference, Bandung World. I mean, think about, you know, Malcolm X, who was in prison, it's a part of this, listening to Paul Robeson recordings, modeling speech after Paul Robeson, friends with Adam Clayton Powell, who is, you know, finds himself caught up there. And then Richard Wright writes a whole book about, could you talk a little bit, not only about the Afro-Asian Conference and the meaning of the Bandung World, with a lot of leaders whose names we know, but then in the following chapter, one of the folk who is involved in the Pan-African Conference of 1945, Kwame Nkrumah sends a call out for everybody to come home and Alphaeus Hutton and, and Dorothy Hutton and, and then Du Bois and my Angelou in a, end up in Ghana <laughs> of all places. And then by the time you, you know, you walk us through that, could you help us understand and continue to expand that global, that global network that you, you so brilliantly map out in, in these chapters? Thank you. Yeah, I mean the connections from from Bandung to Accra are are multiple from Indonesia to to Ghana, and you know this conference in Indonesia it's so important. It's it's the it's the decolonizing world announcing um, their agenda, announcing their presence, insisting on the importance of colonialism, and challenging both of the superpowers. Um, to 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 kind of reframe we might say global politics away from an east west conception of you know capitalist west versus communist east but to a north south a more familiar to, to today's world a north south kind of conception of global north global south again putting that imperial dynamic very much um uh to the fore i mean the participants at bandung were you know, they certainly were not in one mind about any number of things. How could they be? Um, they had different different um, perceptions. Joanne Lai from China is there, for example, you know, like very much part of the, the communist world. Um, the representative, representatives from the Philippines are more aligned with the United States. There's, there's all kinds of, no shortage of tensions, but nonetheless, you know, an insistence. And again, just to think about the the importance of putting racism front and center in in world right. politics, you know, as a shaping global force. Um, 
it's it's really significant. And so, of course, Kwame and the uh, Ghanaian um, activist who have, who had spent time in the United States, of course, as well previously, um, and was at the Manchester Congress, Kwame Nkrumah. Um, you know, goes on to lead. So he's 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 engaged in the struggle, of course, against uh, British imperialism, which which is ultimately successful in 1957. Um, and uh, and that that you know um, independence celebration alone, even even just the the, the moment of independence, Dr. King goes uh, to see to see for himself, and he's very he's very struck by by what he sees as well. Um, so and, and, and Louis Armstrong, which I always find fascinating, man. I mean, what, what do you think it was like, John, for Richard Nixon to be the U.S. delegate? And he gets there and finds all these Negroes from the United States hanging out with their African cousins. That must have sent a shockwave through the Amer as you write about. I mean, what's the response? I mean, you know, because yeah. you talk about the kind of propaganda campaign the United States tries to mount to kind of blunt some of this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and and there's that there's that story. It might be apocryphal, but about Richard Nixon, uh, he turns to to two black gentlemen in in Ghana and says, "How does it feel to be free?" And the answer is, "We don't know. We're from Alabama," because um, <laughs> of course African Americans are there as well, right? Wow. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's a it's a it's an absolute kind of you know nodal point in in global racial politics at this time, and and precisely as you say, you know. People begin to flock there to see and to participate in this in this new um, society. George Padmore, Malcolm X, Shirley Graham Du Bois. You know, many people go there um, to see it, but also to help build it and to make a kind of uh, a new society that that might be that might do something different from you know all of these centuries that have led to to the racial capitalist order at that point. You know, right, ultimately yeah. it's overthrown, of course, but but there's that moment, it's important to hold that before getting to the story of the overthrow, there's that moment from 57 to 66 in which, you know, real possibilities uh, are, are there. Yeah, I, I don't, again, I'm astonished at your ability to weave everybody. I mean, you mentioned Carter Woodson, of course, who ironically becomes caught up in U.S. empire building in the Philippines as a young man, as a teacher in the Philippines. But uh, that period that you mentioned, uh, again, all these young people, Julian Mayfield and Maya Angelou, so many others, David Levering Lewis, <laughs> who ends up going there. But could you mention, as a name you mentioned that uh, some of our folk may not be fam as familiar with, and that's the brother from Trinidad, uh, George Padmore. Could you say a little bit, because you write a lot about Padmore here. Could you say a little bit more about him? Yeah, Padmore is is really important. So he's in he's in Manchester again um, in um, in 1945. He'd already been an activist. He'd been in the U.S. before that. He'd been in Germany um, before World War II as well. And a couple of things about Padmore are really significant. So Padmore is is an anti-fascist who sees fascism as a kind of colonialism. You know, um, many. Mm. Many on the left, of course, many liberals are obviously anti-fascist during World War II. It's the war against the Nazis, of course. Right. But what Padmore is careful to do is to say, OK, yes, this is an enemy that must be fought. And he's a you know, very principled anti-fascist. But let's not let something like British imperialism off the hook as we do that. Let's rather see, without collapsing them into the same thing, the British Empire is not Nazi Germany, but let's see the kinds of structural resonances between them and insist on those as part of our politics. So he has a he's he's a, you know just incredible at at weaving a kind of um, nuanced but nonetheless sort of but but very well explained sort of politics throughout. And he goes to Ghana and he's a really important figure and, and really close to Kwame Nkrumah in in building the new Ghanaian society after 1957. Mm. And then, as you say, uh, John, it all. And this, is, I think, is interesting, bringing it kind of full circle as we kind of tease what we're going to talk about in the final block. Um, you begin this work, as, as you say, reading, close reading of Penny Von Eschen's uh, Race Against Empire with you know, the Council of African Affairs with Jack O'Dell. The, the illusion in some ways that the anti-communist uh, movement in the United States and Great Britain, wherever, smashes all this momentum. You, you know, it doesn't come to an end, does it? I mean, it does survive, but what happens there as these kind of forces begin to convene against these anti-colonial forces that are that are also convening? Yeah, so should we should we take that up after the break or have we got no, a minute for that probably, now? Yeah, that's, that's right. In fact, in fact, yeah, that's right, that's right. Hey, you all. That's a great question. 
Well, it's a 300 page book and you all have to get the anti-colonial front. Trust me, it's well worth it. Uh, so yes, when we come back, we'll pick up with that uh, with Professor uh, John Monroe, his book, The Anti-Colonial Front, The African-American Freedom Struggle and Global Decolonization, 1945 to 1960. Back at a moment at the Black Table. <music> Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We're back at the Black Table in our final segment uh, session with Professor John Monroe, University of Birmingham. And when we left, uh, we were just about to get into the reaction to this global anti-colonial movement. There were a lot of black people involved, but there were a lot of non-black people involved. So, uh, John, help us, man. W what happens to this movement? Because a lot of people are hearing about this movement for the first time, man. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can see, you know, pe people like Stokely Carmichael would be a good example, you know, who bring these politics forward, who as a young person is around kind of Communist Party circles and bring these kind of politics forward into the 1960s. Um, the Black Panther Party, of course, is a, is a great example of a kind of continuation of this. Um, Malcolm X is, you know, among other things, a great internationalist. And obviously the influence of his politics, you know, can't, can't be, uh, you can't say enough about the influence there, of course. One place I would point, I would point to us, but to see a bit more specifically the kind of political formation I'm talking about, the calling the anti-colonial front and its and its resonance. One place I would look would be um, a speech that Martin Luther King gives on the 23rd of February, 1968, on the occasion of the 100th uh, year um, anniversary of W.E.B. Du Bois's um, birth. So Du Bois, of course, passed away in Ghana in in 1963. But in 68, Dr. King is asked to to speak about about Dr. Du Bois. And what is he and what does he talk about? Black reconstruction. That's what the talk is about. And it's a conference. It is also that, a meeting. <laughs> and it was a meeting that was that was exactly that was um organized in part by Jack O'Dell as well, you know, and the Freedom Ways group who comes sort of kind of another generation coming out of the Freedom publication um are there. And you know, it's a bit it's 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 widely available. People can look it up, the speech that, that Martin Luther King gives there. But he, in fact, I think he, they published it in, uh, was it after they did it in Freedom Ways, it came out in Black Titan, was it honoring Dr. Du Bois? Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Exactly. And and how does he honor Dr. Du Bois? But by talking about Black Reconstruction, and again, it's kind of, you know, um, critique of capitalism and internationalist vision, which, of course, Dr. King all the more embodied by this time, you know, given his, his criticisms of, of the Vietnam War. So I feel like that would be one, you know, if you want just one, you know, text that sort of bring, bring some of this together in the later 1960s, I think that would be a good example, as well, of course, as the ongoing beyond that activism of, of Jack O'Dell um, to the end and beyond of the, of the entire century. In fact, that, actually, that's perfect, uh, John, as we kind of begin to, to wind things up. Uh, at the end, in the epilogue of, of the book, you, you talk about, you, you raise this, you make this assertion, you say, if neoliberal times are imperial times, uh, there are also tragedies. And you talk about the fact that, you know, the price of freedom, the price of liberation is, is really struggle. And the tragedy in some ways is the price of freedom as well. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you see the contemporary world and movements? Uh, you talk about, for example, Great Britain and the United States coming together. And we had Maribel uh, Mori on a few weeks ago in her book, White um, Philanthropy. She talks about Andrew Carnegie and, and how they wanted to have this Anglo world come together. And here we are in 2022, and we're seeing these kind of global imperial formations continue to try to keep people oppressed. And the legacy of the anti-colonial front isn't just the 60s and 70s. Could you talk about how you see that that uh, new iterations of it coming today? Because you write about some of that at, near the end of, at the end of the book. 
Yeah, gladly. I mean, I would think that the uh, George W. Bush and Tony Blair's war against Iraq is, is, an, is an excellent example of that, a more recent example of that Anglo world in action. And what better sort of lens to view that through than one of anti-imperialist critique, you know? So I feel like, yeah, I've written a book about, you know, these figures, but I'm mostly a student of them, really. Um, they have a lot to teach us about contemporary politics, as well as, you know, they're interesting figures to think about an era in history, and that's important, too. But um, but I feel like a critique of gendered racial capitalism um, and to th- and to see neoliberalism through that lens as well. We, we, we too often, I feel, see neoliberalism as solely a kind of... Um, uh, articulation of capitalism. And, and of course it is, but to understand capitalism without race, for instance, um, is just to is just to diminish our analysis and, and make us less able to challenge the kinds of, you know, inequalities that we might want to contest. So I feel like seeing um, neoliberalism in an imperial context as an ongoing, yeah, it's not the same thing, but it's it's only understandable as a man, as a more contemporary manifestation of these longer standing, centuries long imperial kinds of relations is a way to think through and contest. To have hope in this moment is to learn from from some of the people that um that we're talking about here today. I think absolutely, absolutely, and and one of those people, of course, uh, a man you are able to apprentice with, uh, he and his partner there, Jack O'Dell, as you mentioned, you write about his democracy charter. I wonder if you mind uh, saying a few words about what that was as it speaks to this greater vision of humanity beyond race, beyond class, but certainly grounded in the realities. But what was the, and what is the democracy charter Jack O'Dell articulating? How does that capture some of these struggles that we're fighting today? Yeah, great. I mean, it's a kind of political program that he that he put forward. Um, some of us organized a conference in in his honor in in 2005, um, which uh, which Bill Fletcher gave the keynote at and was a really, a really nice event. And and there and, and in some other places. And there's also I should uh, importantly note in the book that Nikhil Pal Singh has edited, there's a copy of it in there. So so your listeners yes. can, can check that out. And I recommend yes. that they do. And it's essentially a kind of you know, I would maybe call it, you know, Jack O'Dell was sort of a child of the New Deal era, and it's sort of bringing forward some of the some of the social democratic spirit of that era. But I would say, you know, very much um, imbued with with more kind of um, more significant political content in terms of, again, drawing together these these structures, which sometimes we think of as racism, capitalism, homophobia, um, sexism, and, and to think about the way that if we have a concern about any of them, if we have an opposition to any of them, then we need to think about them together. And that's the kind of, you know, with a, with a program of sort of demands, that's what the Democracy Charter puts forward. And I feel like it's a it's a really significant document for all of us to, to study and, and discuss and debate as well, not necessarily just to read and agree with. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, I want to take just a minute or two Uh, because while you're teaching across the pond, you're actually uh, traveling among other places this summer here in the States to ask you about what you're working on now. Because I know, you know, as Duke Ellington often says, one of those guys with Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong, he tried to send out to Blunt Edge some of this stuff. <laughs> but uh, in the 50s, he said, well, what's your what's your favorite work that you're working on, Duke? He's ah, the next one. So what you working on, man? <laughs> Um, I would say that the, a few different things, but the key thing I would say is I'm working on a project that I'm really excited about. It's called the Imperialism Syllabus. Um, and this was something that appeared in digital form uh, on, on the Public Books website. And uh, myself with a, a friend and colleague, Radhika Natrajan, who's a historian at Reed College. She's a historian of the British Empire. I'm a historian, of course, of the United States. And it's a it's it's a public sort of document that it, that appears online, and it's a way of just sort of drawing together some themes about imperialism and suggested suggesting some readings in reference to them. But we're starting to work on kind of shaping this into a book, and it'll be an different it'll be an interesting kind of book because it's meant really for for popular um, engagement. And so we'll be writing up sort of. Um, encapsulations of the different themes that we looked at, uh, slavery, settler colonialism, the Cold War, a bunch of different themes that can be connected through thinking about imperialism. So, so we're working on that, um, and I will be um, uh, meeting with, with Radhika and, and bringing that project forward. So that's the, the main next thing at the moment. Well, thank, thank you, John. In fact, I, I was thinking about this in terms of using the anti-colonial front in the classroom 
and all kind of exercises came to mind. And one of them I thought about was, you know, have students don't touch anything in the book, but the index, go through the index and check off all the names, you know, and then say a little bit about why you know them. So, I mean, Lorraine Hansberry is in there. Mary McLeod Bethune is in These are names we know. And then as we go through the book, find out how your vision of it would change. Uh, let me ask you, um, have you gotten any feedback from folk who have used the book in the classroom or even and or as a teacher yourself? Um, how have your students kind of reacted to the themes you bring up, the scholarship you've done and the connections you've made? And do you have any, in fact, do you have any words for students and not just people who are in formal education, but uh, folks just learning generally about how to, you know, undertake this study to understand the relationship between this historical research and, and our contemporary struggles? Yeah, I mean, that that ind index exercise is wonderful, Greg. Thanks for what a, what a neat way to to approach any book, really. So I'll, I'll be taking that, among other things we've talked about, that'll be one of the things that will be taken away with me here. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I would hope that that if people are using it in the classroom, that that they can talk through exactly some of the things following from your great questions here around making these connections. You know, people know that there was an, a, a civil rights movement in the United States. Like my students in, in the UK certainly know that. But and they also know that England had an empire, but they don't necessarily think that th there's a relationship between those two things. So I think like kind of some of that connective work um, and again, with a mind towards how we're going to challenge these things in the present, you know, as you and I are talking in the wake of several horrific um, instances of, of gun violence in, in Buffalo and, and in Texas, for example. Um, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to contest this stuff? Um, and when it seems so hopeless and I feel like looking to some of the figures and some of the examples of people who also worked and operated under very, very difficult circumstances politically are places we might look. Yes. Very powerful way to end it for now, John. And I hope you will join us again, brother, because uh, we got I mean, I had a whole line of questions even around just Lorraine Hansberry that I wish we could have gotten to. So if you can squeeze out uh, another hour to spend with us at some point down the line, I hope you'll come back and, and join us. But thank you for the time you spent today and for this remarkable work and for the for just for your life of study and practice to date. And I think, you know, thank you for joining us, John. Oh, well, my pleasure. What a what an absolute, again, honor and and, and treat it is to, to get a chance to, to talk with you. Thanks again for such perceptive uh, and, and wonderful questions. Oh, no, with, with a pleasure, man. Work like this deserves people to pay, pay serious attention to it. So, man, thanks again. OK, well, we, we've been joined by Professor John Monroe of Birmingham University. Uh, we've been discussing his book, The Anti-Colonial Front. I encourage everyone to get this book, to read it, to study it. And uh, we will be back at the Black Table in a moment. We'll clear the table and get ready for next week. Back in a moment, the Black Table, Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table, Black Star Network. Uh, we've spent the last hour with Professor John Monroe, author of The Anti-Colonial Front, uh, a remarkable piece of work that reminds us that all of our local lives, our struggles, uh, they really are influenced by the lives and struggles of human beings all over the world. Uh, we've just passed, in fact, the anniversary of the killing of George Floyd two years ago. George Perry Floyd Jr., the North Carolina born, Texas bred son of Larsenia Sissy Jones Floyd and George Perry Sr. and father of Gianna Floyd was murdered by police while calling for his mother in front of Cup Foods and Pawn Shop near the corner of 38th Street and Chicago Avenue in South Minneapolis, Minnesota. His murder coming on the heels of the murders of Brianna Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky and Ahmaud Arbery in, in Georgia set off an international movement. It was called the summer of 2020, uh, The Reckoning. And we know that it was international and it was connected because George Floyd wasn't just murdered on the 25th of May, which is Memorial Day in the United States, a ritual which was started 
May the 1st, 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina by black folk honoring the Union soldiers who had helped fight in the liberation struggle of African people. We heard Professor Monroe uh, talk about W.E.B. Du Bois's 1935 book, Black Reconstruction in America. It's worth a read today, perhaps now even more than ever. So George Floyd wasn't just murdered on Memorial Day in the United States. He was also killed on African Liberation Day, which is May 25th. Uh, 1963, when the Organization of Afro-American Unity was started, but it goes back to African Freedom Day, which was celebrated in April because of Kwame Nkrumah, who we heard Professor Monroe talk about, who he's written about extensively. And if you remember, in an earlier episode of The Black Table, we had Professor Abdullah Kalamat, who writes about the African Liberation Support Committee. In other words, today's episode of The Black Table is particularly important because as we think about George Floyd in the United States, we must understand that George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, all the victims of violence, whether they be in Buffalo or Texas or California, are all part of a larger global violence that we must all resist all the time. And the more we coordinate, the more we connect, as we've seen in this book, The Anti-Colonial Front, the more we connect, the more certain is our victory. So join us next week at The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr, The Black Star Network. Looking forward 